This is the note packet, page 12. We're talking about different ways to solve the same quadratic formula. So the, our same quadratic equation. These four problems are all the same problem, and you're being asked to solve it four different ways to see how these things are connected. And the first problem, if I want to solve this thing, first thing I want to do is divide everything by four. Uh, so I, Because that's a common, uh, greatest common factor. If we factor out the four, we have x squared minus x minus six is equal to zero. And factor that, it's x minus three times x minus two equal to zero, and that leaves us with our solutions of positive three and negative two. Those are our two solutions here. And the second problem, doing the same thing by the quadratic formula, we should end up with the same answers here. Uh, the quadratic formula, negative b, so it's going to be negative negative four to start, plus or minus the square root of, and then in the square root is b squared, so that's negative four squared. Don't forget the negative is getting squared with it, so it's going to become positive 16 minus 4 times 4 times negative 24. b squared minus 4ac. a is 4, c is negative 24. Don't forget that negative sign. The whole thing is over 2 times a, in this case 2 times 4. When I simplify this, what we're going to get, uh, the double negatives cancel out, we're going to get 4 plus or minus. You do this whole mess under the square root, you're going to get square root of 400 all over 8. And then simplify this, the square root of 400 is 20, so it's 4 plus or minus 20 over 8. And when we simplify this thing, we're going to get 3 and negative 2. Same solutions here as we got from factoring. All right. And the second set of problems here underneath, we're going to solve it by completing the square. If you want to complete the square, first step, uh, divide everything by A. And luckily, that's going to work out really nicely. Everything's a factor of 4. So you're going to get x squared minus x minus 6 equals 0. To complete the square, we're going to move the 6 to the other side. So it's x squared minus x equals positive 6. And then completing the square, we're going to take half the middle term, half of 1 is 1 half, and square it, we're going to get 1 fourth. So we add 1 fourth to both sides. Once we've done that, now the left side can be written as x minus 1 half squared is equal to, and I'm going to turn this into an improper fraction, 25 over 4. 6 plus 1 fourth. The nice thing here, the 25 and the 4, these are both perfect squares, so I'm going to be able to take the square root of this side, in our next step, where we take the square root of both sides, we're going to have x minus 1 half equals the square root of 25 over 4. We take the square root of the top and bottom separately. It's positive or negative 5 over 2. And then simply add the 1 half to both sides. x is 1 half plus or minus 5 over 2. And if we solve that thing, we're going to get positive 3, negative 2. Same two solutions. Finally, if you go into Desmos and simply graph this thing, or you graph it by hand either way, uh, you can graph it by hand by finding the vertex, that's negative b over 2a. In this case, it's negative negative 4, or positive 4 over 2a, which is 2 times 4, which is going to be 8. 4 over 8 is going to be 1 half. That's our vertex, and you can do the table if you want. Or in this case, just going into Desmos and drawing the graph, what we're looking for is where it crosses the x-axis. And where it does that, when we look at the graph, it's going to look something like this. We look for the two places where it crosses the x-axis. It's here at negative 2 and over here at positive 3. Those are the same solutions we got the other ways. The vertex here, the uh, x-coordinate for the vertex is this 1 half. So that is going to be this point down here. This is at positive 1 half. And to find the y-coordinate for the vertex, we just plug 1 half into this equation. 4 times a half squared minus 4 times a half minus 24 Spin this out to a nice easy 25. So just to illustrate this, what we found is we get the same solution, uh, the same solutions no matter which way we do it. But there's a little bit of additional information that's in this in here that you may not catch. Uh, and some of them is this number, this 1 half. You can find this 1 half over here in the quadratic formula. When you do 4 divided by 8, that's going to give you the 1 half. It's the same 1 half that we had here to find the x-coordinate for the vertex. We can find the one half in the completing the square. It's right here. Essentially, when we have vertex form, we change the sign on this number for the x coordinate, and we get one half. We don't necessarily get it up here, except that the x coordinate is halfway between these two numbers. So if I add three plus negative two and divide by two, we're also going to get the one half. So we can get the x coordinate for the vertex in each way. This x coordinate gives us also the line of symmetry. It's that line that shows that it's a mirror image left and right. And you'll notice here from this point how far we got to go to the left and to the right to find our solutions. That number is going to be 5 halves or 2.5.
say five halves to the right and five halves to the left, we also have that number here when we complete the square. We also have that number here if we reduce 20 over 8. So we get all this same information, what the vertex is, what the solutions are, and how far to the left and the right the, the solutions are from several different ways solving this quadratic equation. All right. The second one, it's another one. We are going to see some slightly different results here. Uh, but we're essentially doing the same thing. In the first version, if I were to factor this, this is just going to be x plus 4 times x plus 4 equals 0. Our two solutions are negative 4 and negative 4. We get the same solution for both because it's the same factor for both. If we did the quadratic formula, we're going to have negative 8 plus or minus, and it's going to be a big square root of 64, that's the b squared, 8 squared, minus 4 times 1 times 16, all under that square root, over 2a, but a in this case is just 1. There's no number in front of the x squared. So we simplify this a little bit. We're going to have negative 8 plus or minus the square root of this whole mess turns into 0, which is going to make this really nice, and it's over 2. So essentially this plus or minus 0 does nothing, so it's just going to be negative 8 over 2. We're going to get negative 4, same solution we got from factor. If we did this by completing the square, uh, you could write this problem as x squared plus 8x equals negative 16 by subtracting 16 from both sides. So we're going to take half of 8 is 4 and square it, it's 16. And you'll be like, oh, well that's interesting, those are just going to cancel each other out. Yep, that always happens when we have the same, when we have two identical solutions, we're going to get 0 on one side. On the left side here we have x plus 4 squared is equal to that. And then if we take the square to both sides, we get x plus 4 equals 0. And so x is negative 4. One solution that always happens when we have a 0 here, because plus or minus 0 doesn't do anything. And finally, the last one, if we were to go into Desmos and graph it, or use negative b over 2a, that's negative 8 over 2 times 1, negative 8 over 2. Hey, look, that's going to be negative 4 for our vertex. And so if I were to graph this, something slightly weird happens. The graph ends up looking like this. And it only touches the x-axis. It doesn't cross it. It just touches the x-axis at, you guessed it, negative 4. That is both the vertex and the solution here. So again, we have a whole bunch of the same information showing up three different ways here. We have the same solution in all of them, negative 4 in every version of this. We can also tell that we don't have to move left or right like we did in the previous problem to get to the solutions from the vertex because up here, square root of 0. Anytime we have the square root of 0, this is what's going to happen. If we're take, doing the quadratic formula and we take the square root of 0, that means our, our graph is going to touch the x-axis at one spot or we're going to have just one solution. You can see the same thing over here. When we're completing the square, we have our squared is equal to 0. All right. On page 13, one more of these problems, and this one, again, has some different results to it. Right off the bat, we have x squared plus 6x plus 14. Numbers that multiply to 14 and add to 6? Well, nope, there aren't any, so we're not going to be able to factor this. And right off the bat, if you can't factor it, if you have a problem like this, this should tell you that your answers are either going to involve a square root or an i when we cannot factor it. Which one? Well, let's find out by doing the quadratic formula. If you go over here and do the quadratic formula, we're going to have negative 6 plus or minus the square root of, and it's going to be 36, that's 6 squared, minus 4 times 1 times 14, all that under the square root, over 2 times a, which is just going to be 2. If we simplify this a little bit, we're going to have negative 6 plus or minus the square root of negative 20, and right here, I see I'm taking the square root of a negative. That means my answer is going to have i in it. This is going to be an i problem. And the whole thing's over 2. If we simplify this a little bit, I'm going to break down the square root of 20. This is going to be negative 6 plus or minus. And square root of 20 is 2 square root of 5, but it was negative, so there's an i there as well, all over 2. And then if I reduce this, negative 6 over 2 is negative 3 plus or minus. 2's cancel out. The square root of 5, i. So we have our two solutions, negative 3 plus 5i and negative 3 minus 5i are going to be our two solutions. If we did this by completing the square, we should end up with the same answer here. If we complete the square, we're going to subtract 14 from both sides. We'll have x squared plus 6x equals negative 14. And then to make the left side a perfect square, half of 6 is 3. Square it, we're going to have 9. So we add 9 to both sides. Now on the left-hand side, this is x plus 3 squared. And on the right-hand side, we're going to get negative 5. 
When we take the square root of both sides, we're still going to have x plus 3 on the left. But on the right, we're going to have the square root of negative 5. Don't forget that we introduced the square root, so it's got a plus or minus. And that's the same thing as square root of 5i. So last step to subtract 3 from both sides, we get x equals negative 3 plus or minus square root of 5i. Finally, if we go to the graph, here's where something weird happens. If you were to graph this in Desmos or on a graphing calculator, the graph will just do this. And it's never going to touch the x-axis. That's because there are no real numbers on this line that are solutions to this thing. We can still find the vertex. You can get the x-coordinate for the vertex by looking in the quadratic formula. It's right here. Or in completing the square, it's right here. The x-coordinate for this is going to be at negative 3. You can also do the negative b over 2a formula that we use, but we'll end up getting the same thing. This is our axis of sim our axis of symmetry so it's left and right but because the graph never crosses the x-axis that tells us we're going to have i's for our solution and from this is you know, pretty much impossible with what we know right now to figure out what the solutions are that involve the i all right so the next thing we want to talk about is the discriminant which is the idea here of how could we tell that we were going to get i in this problem and we mentioned back here all the way up to the top we could see it here when we were going to try to take the square root of negative 20 over in this problem we tried to take the square root of negative 5. We could tell that the problem is going to be uh, have imaginary solutions. In fact, sometimes it's the only thing we care about. So here on the bottom of page 13, we're being asked to just decide if we're going to have one real solution, two real solutions, or two imaginary solutions. Well, the easiest way to figure that out is just to look at this part of the quadratic formula. The negative, or the b squared minus 4ac. If we do that and it ends up being uh, a positive number, we're going to get two, two real solutions. If it ends up being a negative number, we're going to get two imaginary solutions. If it ends up actually being zero, we're going to get one real solution. And that's all we're being asked to figure out here is whether or not we get real imaginary solutions. And if it's real, is it one or two? Well, it's pretty easy. We're just going to plug things into this formula, b squared minus 4ac. So in this case, b is negative 12, so it's negative 12 squared minus 4 times 9 times 4. And if we do this right, we're going to end up just getting 0. This is like most problems on the previous page where we have plus or minus square root of 0. That's when we get just one real solution. And that's it. That's all we're being asked to find. We just have one real. If we do the second problem, it's negative 12 squared. That's the b squared minus 4 times 9 times 8. The only thing that changed was the 8 here. And if we simplify this, we're going to get negative 144, and that's the number that's going under the square root. If I try to take the square root of a negative number, I'm going to get imaginary solutions. In this case, we're going to get two imaginary solutions, or technically, I guess they'd be complex. And the last one, same thing, negative 12 squared minus 4 times 9 times 2 this time. If we crunch these numbers, we're going to get 72, and we have to take the square root of 72, it's going to come out to something, uh, but it's not going to be uh, it's not going to be a negative under there. It's not going to be zero, so that means we're going to get two normal solutions. We get two real solutions this way. Next page on page fourteen, we're expanding on what we understand about the relationship between the graphs and the solutions here. So here I got a uh, quadratic graph. What are the solutions to the equation? We can see them right here and right here. The two solutions are negative two and positive eight. So, if those are the two solutions, then what are the factors? Well, if negative 2 is the solution, then x plus 2 must have been one of the factors, and x minus 8 would have been the other one. So, what's the equation of this thing? Well, it's y equals, and you could factor out, x plus 2 times x minus 8. If we FOIL that out, we'll end up getting y equals x squared minus 6x minus 16. We can tell what that equation was from the graph just by looking at those two solutions. Now, there's another trick here, because what if... Uh, so there was a common factor that could have been distributed in here. That doesn't change those solutions. Well, that's what the vertex is going to be for. We'll see that in the next problem. So the next problem, looking at the graph, our two solutions are negative 5 and positive 1, which means the factors were x plus 5 and x minus 1. If we multiply that thing out, what we're going to get for an equation is x squared plus 4x, minus 5. But 
if we check this, if we uh, find our, our solutions and plug them in here, we're going to get the uh, we're going to get something wrong here. We're going to plug in negative two. That is the y or the vertex here. Halfway between five and one is x equals negative two. So the x coordinate of the vertex is supposed to be negative two. If we plug that in, <coughs> pardon me, we're going to get uh for our vertex if we plug in negative two we're going to get nine and this says in the picture is supposed to be 27 so what's going wrong here is that there was another number being multiplied into this equation this whole thing had a gcf and what that gcf was we multiplied by some number here what that gcf was is how far is the nine off from the 27 i'm sorry i said nine it should have been negative nine what what was the number we multiplied by that would turn the negative 9 into negative 27? It was 3. So that tells us there was a great, a common factor that was taken out of this thing, uh, out of the original one that was graphed here to create these two solutions. So we can find a GCF as well. So if I wanted to update my, my equation here, I could change this to 3x squared plus 12x minus 15. And that's the actual graph that we see here. All right, we're going to try that one more time on this last one, looking at the graph. What are our solutions? Well, the solutions are negative 5 and 9. Those are the two places where it crosses the x-axis. So the factors are x plus 5 and x minus 9. So the equation, if we multiply this whole thing out, we're going to get y equals, and it's x squared minus 4x minus 45. But the lesson we learned in the last problem is this whole thing could be multiplied by some common factor, which doesn't change those solutions. We can only tell from the vertex. So it's times something. We don't know what that is. Sometimes we represent that with the letter K. K for a constant, just some kind of number here. Now, we can tell the x-coordinate for the vertex. It's halfway between 5 and, uh, sorry, negative 5 and 9. So to find the x-coordinate for the vertex, we're just going to average them. Negative 5 plus 9 over 2. And if we do that right, we're going to get 2. That's the x-coordinate for the vertex. This number right here should be 2. If we plug 2 into this equation, if we take 2 and plug it back into this equation, we do 2 squared minus 4 times 2 minus 45, we're going to get negative 49, which is not what it says here. It's negative 245. So the question is, what was this extra number multiplied in that turns negative 49 into negative 245, so just negative 245 divided by negative 49, and it turns out the whole thing got multiplied by 5. So this number here should have been a 5, and if I multiply that back into the original problem, we'd have 5x squared minus 20x minus 225. That is the equation that was shown in that graph. All right, last thing, page... 15. All right. If we go into Desmos and we were to graph this equation, we get a real simple graph. Uh, a parabola, it will look something like this. And we can find our two solutions here and here. We can find the vertex as well from looking at the graph. The solutions, we have a 1, 0 here for this one. We have negative 3, 0 for this other one. And the vertex here is at negative 1, negative 4. All right, so we've done sketching the graph, label the x-intercepts, and label the vertex. What are the solutions to this equation? So it's the same equations up here. So what are the solutions? We can tell from the graph the solutions are negative 3 and positive 1, just from looking at the graph if we do it that way. And now here's this problem, which says take the same equation, the same one that we graphed up here, except multiply it by 3, some constant, that k at the end. How is that going to change the graph? What happens is if we were to type this mess in, the same equation times 3, we get the same graph with the same solutions, except now it's 3 times taller. So this new coordinate here is just going to be, we're still going to have negative 1 for the x-coordinate, but the y-coordinate is going to be negative 4 times this 3, we'll get negative 12. So when we have some number being multiplied in, it doesn't change the solutions, it just changes how tall or short the, uh, the, the lumps get in our graph. The last one here, same equation, except now it's being multiplied by negative 1. What happens if we take that same equation and multiply it by negative 1? We get the same original equation, except it's upside down. And this might make more sense to you from your Algebra 1 class, or from your Geometry class, 
that this black graph here is a reflection across the x-axis of the original red graph. We still have the same solutions where it hits the x-axis, but it's upside down. Anytime we, have, uh, we end up with a negative in front of our x squared, our graph's going to be upside down like that. So with all that in mind, can we solve an uglier problem like this? This is a fourth degree equation, next to the fourth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the higher the exponent, the more wiggles our graph gets. But we can still use the same information that we've been using to find a whole bunch of information about this graph. For example, what are the solutions? Well, it crosses right here at negative 5, it crosses right here at negative 1, it crosses right here at positive 3, and finally all the way over here at 9. It's a fourth degree equation. We have four solutions. What are those solutions? It's negative 5, negative 1, 3, and 9. Those are all the solutions. So I could write the equation that does this graph. It would look like this. Y equals, and I'm just going to change these into factors. It's x plus 5 times x plus 1 times x minus 3 times x minus 9. And I should remember that it could have some uh, common factor that's distributed in. So technically times some number k. Maybe it's a 5 or a 10 or whatever. Uh, it won't be a negative number because if it was negative, this graph would be upside down. We'd have be in the negatives on the ends here. So here's what that equation looks like. One of the things we'll get to eventually is how to multiply this whole mess out. What would this graph look like if I multiplied by negative 1? If this was a negative 1, it would be like this. It would be the same graph except upside down. 